Blessings you are, and thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me down. Uh, quite exciting. Um, it's been a busy day meeting a lot of people, and, and uh, but I'm really excited to give you guys this uh, talk. Um, as Dennis said, talking about coral reefs and listening to coral reefs, or sort of another way to think about this is, is eavesdropping on marine life. So we're kind of listening to their their conversations out there. Um, just a little bit of background sort of about me and our lab's research in, at Woods Hole. Basically, so I study animal sensory biology. So I try and sort of get inside the head of the, these animals. So uh, my animal can be often diverse. So I've studied from squids to dolphins and whales. Um, the animal here you see here is a snapping shrimp. So you can probably find them just outside on the, on the pier here. They have one very large claw, as you can see on the right, and then a, sm a smaller claw, in this case, on the left. And we try and basically figure out why these animals sort of do what they do and getting inside, again, their head, their perspective of the world around it. So the, the old German perspective of that is the umwelt of the animal, basically. Um, and so most of the time we get inside their head figuratively, sort of through experiments, but sometimes we do it uh, actually somewhat literally through dissections and, and electrodes and that kind of thing. But again, so sort of the animal's perspective. And my background is in hearing and sound in the sea and bioacoustics. And so um, a, lot of, a lot of our work focuses on hearing and, and sound production of these animals. So I not only study the animals here, but we study the environmental signals and the cues that are out there. So uh, the sounds that are out there for these animals. So um, that's mostly what I'm going to focus about today. So the sounds and the availability of sounds on, on coral reefs. And as Dennis mentioned, I also try and put, um, with sort of our changing world, I try and put that into a focus of some of our work. So we look at some of the human impacts of these sounds as well. Um, and so inhuman noise that's encroaching on marine animals as well as uh, uh, how animals cope or adapt to that. So um, when you stick your head in the water, I, well, as we sort of get into this, I kind of want to think about sort of your, your own sort of acoustic world, right? So when you woke up in the morning or you walked outside your house in the morning, you probably had a little sense of what that, that world is even before you're, you sort of looked outside the door, right? So you can get in, get an idea of whether it's raining because you can hear the, set, the rain, sound of rain on the roof or the windows. If it's windy because you can hear that against the, the wind as well and the, and, the, the, and the branches lapping against the, the window pane. But when we think of the ocean, we don't necessarily think of those sounds, right? We kind of often think of it as a relatively quiet um, environment. Part of that is because we don't hear very well in the water. Part of that is as we're uh, scuba diving around, we hear our own bubbles being made and our own breathing apparatus, our own scuba apparatus, but so we don't really hear the sounds that these animals are making. Right? We don't hear very well in the water. And of course, this, this sort of um, myth uh, or idea was sort of perpetuated or leveraged by uh, Jacques Cousteau, who, who, uh, who pioneered quite a bit of underwater science, but and had some Oscar award-winning films entitled The Silent World, right? But, but as we're, the more we're investigating, and the U.S. Navy can tell you that the, our marine life is not really, not really very silent. There's quite a bit of sounds out there. Um, and so to just give you a quick primer on this, so we've actually known that there's been sounds in the sea since um, Aristotle, or in this case here, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And there's a quote from da Vinci that basically says that if you, you, know, if you cause your ship to stop, and you basically put a long tube in the water and place your ear to that tube, you can hear other ships at a really great distance. So he knew very early on, 500 years ago, that, that sound conducted well underwater and that there was, there was sound out there in the water. And, um, but it took until about the 1800s or so until we began to kind of leverage that, that sound in the water, began to experiment. And so this is a, bit, uh, a Swiss experiment that basically rang a bell at the boat on your left and then someone using Leonardo da Vinci's tube on the right and basically listening to that sound some distance away. So they're listening to basically how that sound is connect, conducted in the marine environment. It's again, showing that sound can be conducted underwater, which was not really known as a fact even at that time. But this was sort of the late 1800s, and then sound sort of steamrolled a little bit, or this study of sound in the marine, in the marine environment. Um, as we picked up into the early 1900s and uh, facing north towards World War I, where we're trying to understand where German U-boats are under the, under the water, where mines are under water, and we really began to leverage and understand that sound can be a useful way to basically find, find these objects. And so this is, initially this was just listening. So this is a, a, a submariner's sonar uh, listening device. You can see there's just a stethoscope basically here connected to some tubes. 
and listening to the outside of that submarine, but basically just listening for, for the engine of a U-boat um, passing by. Um, and then after World War I, again, this really blossomed and bloomed, this, this, this sound in the sea study, um, to what we have today, which is using sound in terms of fish finders, so we can find schools of fish, so we can catch our fish, navigating so you don't drive your boat into a sandy shoal to know how deep it is. And of course, a lot of our oil and gas extraction and our, and our, and our uh, mineral extraction is utilized, utilizing sound in the sea as well. Um, but again, this is, so we've sort of utilized sound in the sea quite a bit, but again, this is not really talking about the animals that produce the sound, right? This is how we've sort of leveraged sound being conducted underwater. But again, how do, how do animals use sound? And that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, again, bringing it back to the U.S. Navy, one of the banes of the U.S. Navy early on as they began to listen to the, the sounds of the marine environment are these animals that I'm going to be talking about today, and I introduce as these, these snapping shrimp. And this is, this is basically a publication from the University of California's Division of World War Research, which is basically the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in, in San Diego, early on investigating what's called the bedlam of noise in the marine environment. And they were the ones who basically figured out this bedlam of noise was essentially these snapping shrimp communicating to each other in the marine environment. Um, and so, the, in a way, the Navy was really some of the ones that began to pioneer um, that this ocean is sort of a noisy place. It's filled with a lot of biotic sounds, uh, animal-produced sounds, as well as abiotic sounds, the physical sounds out there, the wind, the waves, and the rain. Um, and these are just a few examples of sound I'm going to play for you. These are three sounds, a domino damselfish, snapping shrimp, and a dolphin click that were recorded all on the same reef um, where I did my PhD. This is a, a Kaina Point, Hawaii. Um, and just three sounds out there. I'll give you a little uh, sample of what he's heard out there. Um, Here's that bedlam of noise, this crackling snapping shrimp. Some people ask, often equate it to a crackling bacon, frying bacon. And then uh, same area here, again, dolphin clicks swimming by. And most of the sounds that these dolphins make, as of course, are ultrasonic. But of course, in the ocean, right, we don't necessarily hear those sounds in, in uh, sort of one at a time. They often all happen, right, sort of in concert together. So we have snapping shrimps and the dolphins and the dolphins all click together, and it becomes a very, very noisy environment just like I just created for you. So um, it really is quite a pretty, pretty noisy uh, reef environment there. One of the reasons that sound uh, is so ubiquitous in the ocean is because it travels really well underwater. It travels five times faster than it does in air. Um, and because it travels efficiently, it travels long distances, so it can be used over long distances. So animals, some, for example, some whales, can potentially communicate across ocean basins. Um, we also know that, uh, so because the sound travels so efficiently, we also know, know that a lot of animals have basically leveraged this capability. That they hear and produce sound underwater, and it really is this, quote, primary sensory modality, a primary way that animals find their way around the marine environment. And it can be particularly important when light levels are low or light and other cues aren't really available. So at night, basically, or at depth, where there, it's called the aphotic zone, where there essentially is no light, or in murky water, where, for example, you go out right here in the harbor and you don't necessarily see very far, but again, that sound can go quite a, quite a distance. And so sound use, hearing and sound use, have been shown across taxa. Um, so dolphins are considered basically specialists in, in uh, hearing, um, but there's also fish that hear, teleos fish, bony fish, Goldfish are actually specialists in hearing as well. Um, Cartilaginous fish, there's the sharks and rays, they can detect sound. And this, which you can maybe see you make out here, is a squid. And we found that they also detect sound, or they can hear as well. Um, and of course, one of the challenges for marine animals, marine life, is that um, we as humans, as we utilize the ocean, we basically put more noise into that ocean. This is increasing what's called increasing anthropogenic noise. And so what you see here is basically heat maps of noise in the ocean uh, the two are basically the, here on the left are the uh, North Atlantic, and then the one on the right is the Gulf of Mexico. And these hotter colors basically are indicative of, of, of more noise. The North, central North Atlantic is really uh, responsible for a lot of shipping noise, or stems from a lot of shipping noise out there. And the Gulf of Mexico area is basically a lot of oil and gas exploration and extraction. 
um, and that makes a lot of noise in the marine environment. And we actually see that these noise levels are basically doubling every decade since the 1960s. So every year as we put more ships into the ocean, we're creating more noise that animals have to cope with. And, uh, and as I mentioned, these are coming from a lot of different sources, commercial shipping being the most probably uh, dominant, um, Navy sonar being m maybe more notorious, but actually a little bit less prevalent, um, resource extraction such as uh, oil and gas extraction, and scientific research actually puts a lot of noise into the marine environment as well. And we know from other studies that I'm not really going to talk about today that this can impair basic biological activity. So it can cause temporary hearing loss, it can impair communication, um, or impair how animals navigate in the marine environment. Um, and these are just two examples of a beaked whale stranding that's been in response to anthropogenic uh, sonar. And of course, there's been some later studies that have looked at how sound can basically affect fish mortality as well. So to take a step back, we're, we're figuring out that sound's really important in the ocean, but you know, we're trying to figure out where, where, where's the best place to begin to kind of understand this, especially in sort of shallow water coastal environments, which are sort of rich with biodiversity. And we kind of landed on coral reefs. Coral reefs are, are often thought of as basically the rainforest of the sea, so the productivity there and the biodiversity can rival that of, of terrestrial rainforest. It harbors, harbors 33% of all marine uh, animals on coral reefs. Um, it really su supports uh, economies and, and communities, so it supports people quite often. So in terms of food resources, such as catching these fish, protein, shoreline protection from major storms, and the tourism industry, and the World Wildlife Fund has estimated that annually coral reefs are worth worldwide a trillion dollars um, per year. And so that's quite a, quite a bit of money, and disproportionately a lot of that comes, goes at least to the uh, developing countries. We also know that our reefs are under threat. So there's substantial degradation of, of reefs from a variety of factors. So that might be overfishing of these reefs, um, development will encroach on reefs, eutrophication or nutrient influx can impair our reefs, global warming, acidification, uh, different, different factors. And this is basically a reef in Maui um, that we actually we're studying acoustically. Um, you can see that most, all of those white dots there are basically coral and they've, been, they've sort of bleached out. This is uh, October 2015. So as these reefs are basically impaired, this also re results in decreased economic worth of those reefs and decreased ecosystem services, so how we can basically utilize those reefs, and a loss of habitat for marine animals as well, and decreased ecosystem resilience. So this is, again, sort of impairing shoreline protection and how we may basically utilize reefs. So understanding and monitoring these changes becomes pretty important. But Monitoring, and monitoring reefs and monitoring underwater is particularly challenging activity, right? So as we all know, Florida is probably a great example. If you have a boat, boats are expensive to maintain and keep up, right? So um, they are, uh, these traditional setups, basically traditional surveys are often, particularly in remote regions, are difficult, they're expensive and require many people. So for example, NOAA is, uh, uh, is in charge of uh, reefs here in the central Pacific in Palau and in uh, uh, Palmyra and other locations. And um, we only go there every other year in order to basically do those surveys because, and get a snapshot of, of the reef because, because it's so costly to get our ships out there and get our divers out there. So really, in between those times, if bleaching happens or degradation happens, we don't really know, know when or why that happens. So we're trying to get a better way of, or more efficient way of monitoring those reefs. So that's sort of the goal, goal here. So we're trying to leverage, basically, in my lab, sound in the sea and what's called bioacoustics. Um, applying sort of our acoustic tools here and the soundscape analyses may provide a solution to basically more effectively monitor uh, this marine environment. So this term soundscape is kind of a relatively new term. But the idea is that it's, it's analogous to your visual landscape. It's basically, but just acoustically, it's all the sounds that are out there. So it's the biological sounds, the fish sounds, and the invertebrate sounds, the dolphin sounds as well as the, uh, the wind, the waves, and the rain, as well as the human-produced noise. That, in the entirety, is your, is your soundscape. It happens above water and happens below, uh, below water as well. And we also know from other studies that basically sounds and marine habitats are indicative of biological processes. So spawning events and courtship, those are, those are often associated with sound. So the damselfish sound that I played you in the beginning, um, that damselfish is a male damselfish kind of swimming up in the water column doing what's called a signal jump and basically tr trying to attract females to his nest to, to, to spawn. Um, we know the feeding produces sound. Parrotfish are a great example of, of that as well. 
um, as a crunch on the, on the algae, then that makes a sound, and we can measure in, in that. Um, and we also know that territorial defense makes uh, sound as well. Snapping shrimp seem to be a good example of that as well. So we can use these passing listening tools to really provide data on how healthy our coral reef community is, how well it's structured, and then potentially changes, such as these bleaching events or major storm events. So <clears throat> that's kind of what I'm going to talk to you about today, some of our project goals. How we're, um, but the first off is like when we try and figure out how these measures sound in the sea, we need to figure out how best to do that. And that's, so that's been the focus of my lab for the past few years, how do we really make good measurements good soundscape measurements. So looking at the spatial variability, the difference between reefs or the difference within a reef, as well as um, how sound basically changes over time. I'll tell you a little bit about that. And we're comparing those to basically traditional measures. So the traditional visual surveys, for example, that NOAA uses that goes out there to basically visually survey and, and count, for example, coral or fish. Um, and we want to compare these acoustic measures that we're taking with, again, sort of that habitat health, as well as potential changes in those habitats. And then a final I'll kind of round out, I'll talk to you a little about how we can track human usage patterns of areas, particularly in remote areas that are a little bit hard for us to monitor on a regular basis. And finally, the last point I kind of want to get across here was how, um, again, why this might be important for animals. And, and one of the ideas that basically that um, larvae, fish larvae and coral reef larvae potentially use sound to find their way home, to find their way back to the reef. Um, so we know in some, ex some experiments that, that coral reef larvae are attracted to sound. So if you put a speaker in the water, they'll swim towards, and you play a reef sound, they'll swim towards that speaker. And we know this is a model of a postdoc in my lab, a uh, model that she created, um, measuring sound on an oyster reef in Pamlico Sound, North Carolina, and then actually tracking the larvae in that sound as well, uh, in, that, in that area as well. And so this top image that you see here is what's called a spectrogram. So on the y-axis is frequency. Uh, different acoustic frequencies. On the x-axis, sort of the bottom, the bottom axis there is uh, basically can be thought of as time or distance here. So, um, and hotter sounds basically, or hotter colors mean more sound. And so you can envision or what she is modeled is basically as the oyster larvae basically travels to the water column, it gets closer and closer to the reef, and that reef gets louder and louder, um, and, the, and the larvae begins to drop out of the water column and settle or find its way to the reef and kind of find their finding their way home to the reef. So importantly, this is really studied in Pamlico Sound, North Carolina, but we really don't know how these mechanisms really work in, in our rich, diverse, biodiverse uh, or, uh, coral reefs. And so that's sort of the goal here, is to really understand a coral reef soundscape and how it may function in terms of supporting reef resilience. And that larval coming, those larvae coming back to the reef is really the resiliency of a reef. and can really replenish a reef after it's been impacted by bleaching or climate change or big storms. And we're looking at this in a way that's kind of thought about basically acoustic diversity. And so this is actually, we're leveraging an idea that's been proposed again in a very diverse habitat, um, terrestrial rainforest habitats. And the idea is that basically a really full acoustic, acoustic spectrum that I showed you there before can be a predictor of biodiversity. So the idea is that if you go outside your house and you hear the crickets and you hear all the sorts of birds and you hear the, you hear the other animals making sounds basically, that, that rich spectrum is reflective of a rich and biodiverse habitat. Whereas if you go walk outside and it's totally silent, maybe there's not that many animals there. So how can we basically leverage that soundscape to understand or basically estimate the biodiversity of that habitat? So kind of the talk and outline I'm going to take you through a little bit here is looking at um, uh, the coral reef soundscapes and linking those soundscapes to the, coral, the fish and the coral communities. I'm going to be particularly working in the U.S. Virgin Islands, the USBI, um, using passive listening acoustics to track human patterns out there. Um, and then I'll tell you just briefly at the end how we're kind of taking some of this, some of this work forward. So the site that we're working here in is the U.S. Virgin Islands National Park. So I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's a really awesome place to work. Uh, it's diverse in terms of fish, 302 fish species, about 50 species of coral, numerous soft coral species as well, the sponge communities. Um, it's got comparative locations, seagrass and mangrove beds that we can also address. Um, it gets half a million visitors per year, so and it's notable for snorkeling and diving. Um, National Geographic Ma uh, and Condé Nast Magazine have noted Trunk Bay, 
there, one of the best beaches in the world. Um, and so it's a notable, notable place basically for uh, us, to, us to work in terms of beautiful reefs as well as important for the, the national park. In particular, the place that we're working out of is called the Virgin Islands Environmental Resource Station. So you can kind of see it just here in the bottom, what's called Veers. Um, these are the cabins that we stay in here. Um, it, it provides a, a huge amount of logistical support for us, uh, basically a home base, a field station that we can work from. It's part of the University of the Virgin Islands. Um, and importantly, this is a really comparative space, uh, site for us to look at as well. So we can basically leverage some long-term NSF studies that have been going on there, some uh, NSF-funded research. Um, National Park has been studied in this area for a long time. The U.S. Geological Survey has been studied in this area for a long time. And I'll talk a little bit about Tektite, if you haven't heard about that site before. But it's got quite a bit of, of uh, history to it as well, which is something that we can leverage. Um, again, now the bottom picture here is basically the image of the south side of St. John, the Veers area where we're working. Um, and the uh, arrow on the, on the right is basically where our cabins are. The area on the left is basically where our dock and our lab is. And then here's, these are two coral reefs that, we, that I'll be focusing on today. So we've gone out there. Uh, in 2013, we went out there and examined 20 different sites, basically. And the goal is to kind of replicate reefs of high quality, lots of diversity, uh, medium quality, sort of medium and low quality reefs. Um, and basically compare our soundscape, our acoustic measurements, to our visual surveys of those. Um, and um, basically, we based this on some initial scuba surveys, sometimes just sticking our head over the side of the boat, um, and uh, some of our NOAA shallow water benthic habitat maps, so some, some NOAA data as well. But trying to get an idea of where exactly these reefs are and how good are they. Um, and when, and for a larger study, we've looked at nine different reefs, three of high coral cover, three of medium, three of low coral cover, and some sandy controls and mangrove controls as well. Um, these are just like the species richness here. And I don't really want you to pay a whole lot of attention to this. But I just want to kind of show you that we're going to kind of focus on, for the purpose of the talk, three sites, which kind of, kind of makes the story a little bit uh, more straightforward to convey. And these are Tektite, Yawzi, and Ramhead. And so you'll kind of want to remember those names, but I'll kind of repeat them as we go along. So Tektite was our high coral diversity site. Yawzi is our medium, and Ramhead is our low. Uh, Tektite, or TK, is, and Yawzi, YA, they've been, they've been studied for over 30 years. Um, Ramhead is really well studied as well. And um, Tektite in itself is a pretty particularly cool site because this is a, the height, a site of an early NASA and Navy underwater habitat. So in the late 60s, early 70s, they basically put this underwater habitat that you can see here on the left, a drawing of it on the right, where people would go and live down there for weeks at a time. And then they were sort of adapted, their pressure adapted to the, the local water environment, and then they could go out and explore the reef. So not having to deal with sort of the, the typical diving pressures you have to do when you go up and down on a scuba dive. They're just always at depth, and so they're adapted to always be at depth. And so they could live there. And so quite a few famous marine, uh, bio, uh, marine oceanographers have spent a lot of time there. Sylvia Earle, for example, um, and uh, as well as future ast astronauts. And so the idea was that they would kind of prepare themselves in this weightless environment, but also sort of study the marine life as well. And so this gave us a really cool place that we could build from. And we haven't gotten our hands on them yet, but they actually did some acoustic recordings in the late 60s. And that's kind of cool for us to basically um, compare to. So I'll talk to you about kind of two studies, really. We're going to focus on the acoustics in this talk here. But we did an initial four-month study in 2013. And then in that time period, we also started a five-year study that we've kind of been going on until now and have at least have a few more years to, to look at. And that's the greater reef comparison. The first one was basically um, uh, focusing on our three reefs, Tektite and Yawzi. So we have a really, and Ram said, so we have a really long data set on those. Um, and just to give you a little background here, we're really getting a huge picture or snapshot of the health of these reefs in these areas. And I'm not going to talk a lot about like some of the other things that we're doing here, but we're doing quite a bit of stuff. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But we're looking at all the larval fish um, that settle to these reefs or come to these reefs. Again, I mentioned that, that sounds are supposed to be a cue for larvae to find their way home to a reef. And so we're looking at, do these, do these louder, more diverse reefs attract more settlers, settling larval fish? Um, 
we're looking at the microbes in the water as well as the nutrients in there, the microbial ecology, different metrics of health of these reefs as well. And then we're doing these experiments for coral and fish settlement experiments. So actually playing back reef sounds and trying to figure out a way that we can enhance resilience of reefs. So if we play a healthy reef sound, do we bring in more larvae? And um, I'm kind of not going to really get to those get to those results today, but we're just doing a huge amount down there. It's really, really a cool project. Um, the stuff I'm going to be talking about today really focuses on work by two people in my lab, Ashley Lewis on the left uh, and Max Kaplan on the right. And Ashley is a postdoc in my lab, and Max is a recent uh, graduate student, a uh, recent graduate. And so to give you a little perspective, these are some of the acoustic therp recorders that we use. The one is basically built by us at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the DEMON that you see on the left here. And we deploy in all sorts of ways, including just strapping to a cinder block and <laughs> dry, dropping down to the bottom of the ocean. Um, and as well as uh, what's called sound traps that are made out of New Zealand. And we're doing uh, what's called one channel, so one hydrophone, as well as uh, four channels, uh, four channel sound traps that you see here. We're also pairing this, those light and temperature sensors out there as well, so we want to get a sense of the, the physical parameters as well as our sort of acoustic parameters. As I mentioned, we're looking at neutro, nutrients and microbes and larval settlement as well. So as I mentioned, the first thing we needed to really do is figure out how many recorders we would need to kind of go out and make these measurements. And so we did this early on in 2013, looking at um, basically recording, going out there for two 24-hour periods, recording continuously. 24-hour periods, and we did this with multiple recorders spaced four meters apart on our three reefs, Tektite, Yazi, and Ramhead. You kind of see uh, imaged here in, in red, these little red squares. And we basically, again, could just utilize that by putting our, our recorders on a cinder block and dropping them down for 24 hours. And again, we measured, started at the same time, long-term recordings where on multiple sites now we're putting out uh, one recorder, uh, 10 sites, at least 10 sites, actually a little bit more. Uh, for now what's now a five-year data set. So as I mentioned, we really want to compare this to like the, the, the traditional way that people go out and survey reefs. And so this is basically visual surveys. So um, we use sort of NOAA adapted methods and we kind of um, in both uh, looking at the fish to the lowest taxonomic level as well as the benthics, the benthic species as well. So that means the coral cover, the algae cover, other substrates such as sand or what's called pavement, which is just sort of dead coral um, or hard substrate. Um, and we're doing transects, um, multiple transects or multiple surveys on each reef. You see here. And so the first thing we can kind of do is compute our visual survey results. So this is kind of getting into the, sort of our assessment of the reefs here before we get to the acoustics. And so um, on the y-axis here, as you see, uh, portion of coral cover, and the x-axis, the bottom axis, is different um, substrates. So coral, macroalgae, and other, so that could be sand or anything else. And, and remember, we have our three sites, Tektite, which is our healthiest site, Yazi with, um, in green, which is our medium site, and Ramhead, which is our more impaired site. And you can see that Tektite had a, had a um, higher benthic coral uh, proportion cover, so more coral on Tektite. So again, it kind of was our nicer reef, which kind of nice that it bared out that way in our visual, actual visual assessments. And we also saw that uh, uh, that in terms of fish, we had similar trends. So this is basically fish density, fish per meter squared. Um, and we broke that out into herbivores, invertebores, and consumers are basically large predator fish. And we found that uh, Tectite, again, had the most herbivores, and it also had the most consumers. So it's sort of the highest diversity of fish, as well as the highest diversity of, uh, of uh, coral. Um, Get, break this down a little bit further. This is just one set of survey results, but basically this is looking at the new recruits, the smaller fish, as well as the larger fish. Um, those are the ones that are going to be making sounds on the reefs. And we saw that Tektite and Yazi had similar distributions of, of families, but uh, slightly different for, um, for Ramshead here. So again, a sort of a different population of new recruits on, on Ramshead. So something different was happening at that site. And it had much fewer, in just in this one survey, for example, one... Uh, one larger adult here. So it seems to be attracting different settlers and doesn't really maintain its adults in this habitat. Um, in terms of coral, there's often no different numbers of recruits at, tech, at, at these sites as well. So Tektite had, few, had more coral recruits, whereas Ram said, for example, had less coral recruits. 
So there were true, basically, visual differences as we did these surveys. And so that was really nice because we can kind of compare that to our acoustics. So you got a little, got a little assessment of, of acoustics before, but again, this is another spectrogram, and you'll kind of see a couple of these as we move through here. So it kind of want to, again, re-familiarize yourself. But basically, on the y-axis here, this up and down axis is frequency in hertz, so from 0 to 3,000 hertz, and time in seconds on the bottom, the x-axis. And these are just all data basically recorded from, from uh, a snapshot on Tektite. Um, and this gives you an idea of sort of a rich acoustic complexity there. And so I've circled basically the fish sounds, that, um, as well as some humpback whale sounds, and uh, snapping shrimp. And uh, one of the things I want you to kind of pull out um, from this is that the snapping shrimp tend to be the higher frequencies here. They're at the top of the graph, whereas the fish and the whales are, are at lower frequencies. And that became important in terms of our analysis later. But this is what our, our reef sounds like when it's a nice, rich soundscape. That's a fish. Come back. Fish. Come back. Fish. So there's quite a bit of sounds, sounds out there, right? You can hear that bedlam, the Navy's bedlam of snapping shrimp in the background, and you can hear those sort of grunts and different sounds of fish, and then the, the humpbacks as they're kind of uh, cruising by. Um, there's a huge amount of sweet, there's a suite of fish sounds out there. I'm just going to play you several here now. Um, most of the time, we don't know who's making those sounds. We're not kind of, this is, uh, we're kind of looking at the community, the whole acoustic community and the fish community. But there are so many fish species out there making sounds that we don't even really have an understanding of oftentimes who they are. So, for example, we call this fish number one. <laughs> Number two, it's a much quicker sound. Mm. <laughs> Always a crowd favorite, that one. And uh, we'll call this one fish number four. So that drumming sound, there's a lot of background noise in that one because uh, there's more sort of chorusing. We had to zoom in on that sound, but there's, there's drumming. That's our fish. Very cool. And so you can see each of these individual sounds as you move through on the spectrogram. There's again this. This red sort of series of pulses on this graph on the right um, is, our, is our fish sound. Um, <clears throat> again, I kind of, we wanted to compare uh, fish sounds to uh, snapping shrimp sounds, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So again, these are two spectrograms here. Um, the first one on the left is our spectrogram of fish vocalizations. The spectrogram on the right basically has snapping shrimp and, and fish. There's, um, you can see that the, the one on the left has a much shorter axis, so it only goes from 0 to 1,000. The one on the right goes from 0 to 20,000. So the snapping shrimp are happening at a much higher uh, frequency here. Um, and so that, again, became important for our uh, analysis here. So fish between from 0 to 1,000 hertz, and the snapping shrimp band was really from about 2 to 20 kilohertz. So it actually goes towards the, the ultrasonic sounds that we can hear. Um, this is a, a, a different picture of a snapping shrimp, and I just kind of want to take it aside because snapping shrimp are a pretty cool creature, and I'm not talking too much about them today, but uh, it's a focus of Ashley's work in my lab and uh, looking at basically how that they make sounds. And so, as you can see, that, that large claw on the right in this case, um, and for a long time, it was thought that they basically make claws by closing it and um, basically the two parts of the claw hitting each other and making that crack. But in 2000, uh, there was this video here, or there's a study. This is someone prodding their snapping shrimp, getting it to snap, and putting a hydrophone that you see to the left here. And now this is a slow motion video. Actually, it's a high speed video slowed down of the snap. And so what's happening there is the animal's actually uh, making a bubble. 
see, let's start this over. And um, there we go. There's that bubble out front. And uh, so it's closing so fast, it's basically creating a cavitation bubble underwater. And when that bubble implodes, that's what makes the snap, basically. So it's not a physical hitting, hitting each other, but it's basically that bubble imploding. There's another video. There's the bubble. There's the implosion. And so it's a really cool uh, mechanism. And you know, I talked a little bit about that they use this for territorial defense, but um, not always. And we've been doing quite a bit of work in this. And the bottom line, in terms of the sciences, we've done this for quite a few years, and we're not exactly sure why they're making <laughs> this sound most of the time. Um, does seem to be some sort of territorial defense mechanisms at some times. But if you put a snapping shrimp in a jar all by itself, does it make a sound? And the answer is yes, just like a tree falling in the forest. So um, we don't know why it does that, but um, they do. They do sort of on their own. And, um, so there's sort of various theories out there, but we're trying to figure out exactly why they're doing this, why they're creating this bedlam. So as I mentioned, the first thing we really needed to go, do was kind of figure out how to make these, these measurements in the ocean, how best basically make these coral reef measurements. And so this is a, a graph here of sound level, or what's called sound spectral density, sound level on the y-axis, and on the x-axis there, different frequencies and hertz. And as I mentioned, fish are, tend to be these lower frequencies, and shrimp, the snapping shrimp are at a much higher frequency. That becomes important again for our analysis. We can kind of separate the two. Um, but what you see basically see here are these four lines are basically four of those recorders. These are all tectite, all at the same time, all for that 24-hour period. Um, and what I kind of want to point out is that there's a huge amount of overlap there, basically. Um, that even though we put these recorders 20 meters apart, each 20 meters apart in the reef, we're kind of getting the same the same measurements. There's a small amount of variability, and when we run statistics, we had a huge amount of statistical power, so we actually found that these are differences. So there's potentially these microacoustic habitats on the reefs, but um, there's also a huge amount of overlap, and we don't really know if they're, they're biologically irrelevant yet. So for all intents and purposes, these reefs are actually much more similar to themselves than you'll see uh, than other reefs. So tectite, while there are a little bit of differences there, Again, it's more similar to itself than other, than other reefs. So we kind of can kind of take from this that we can really use basically one recorder per reef to really assess that reef. So this is sort of a, a valuable part of our, our study here. So as we begin to kind of compare these reefs, uh, again, sound level on the y-axis, and you're looking at these different, uh, different reefs, tectite in blue, yawzi in green, and ramhead in, in orange. Um, these are basically the sound levels over, over that 24-hour period. Um, and this is actually looking at uh, multiple periods now throughout this. So this is looking at the course of a summer, so averaging throughout the course of a summer. And you can see now, one of the things I want to point out is basically that the greatest peaks, and this is basically now kind of just looking at the low-frequency fish sounds. As I mentioned, we can kind of pair apart the low frequencies versus the high frequencies. These low-frequency fish sounds, tectite has these nice choruses here, these nice peaks at, at 6 a.m. and uh, about 7 p.m. or so. Um, Whereas we don't necessarily see those at the other side, so it's lesser extent at Yawzi and Ramhead. So smaller peaks at Yawzi and not really observable at Ramhead. So we're getting different daily patterns in the fish acoustic activity at these different sites. If we just look at the snapping shrimp, we get a slightly different picture. The shrimp peaks are a little bit less clear, um, but the highest sound pressure is actually at Yawzi, so not necessarily the most diverse site, um, followed by Ramhead and then tectite uh, for all times of day. And they kind of follow the same patterns, but there's a stronger peak at, at, at uh, dusk, in this case, for all three reefs. Um, but importantly, a little bit different from, uh, from the fish. If we just focus that, kind of smooth that data out here again, this is basically just looking at those snapping shrimp sound levels. So again, 2 to 20 kilohertz, and the sound level, the sound pressure level, again, on the y-axis, and again, the time of day on the x-axis. Yawzi here in green, and tectite in blue. Um, and you can see what's kind of cool is these basically these daily peaks, these crepuscular peaks that are happening at essentially at dusk and dawn. Um, if we again look at the fish bands, like another way to kind of look at this again now, but this is just low, lower frequencies. Tectite in blue, and Yawzi in green, and Ramhead in orange. Uh, again, not very clear, not kind of messier at Ramhead. 
but you can kind of see some multiple nice fish peaks at tech type. So a bunch of different kinds of choruses happening. There's probably multiple fish sounds basically happening here. So multiple fish choruses basically overlapping. And that's kind of cool because it seems like if you want to be a fish to make a sound, you don't want to make it at the exact same time as another fish. So they can kind of space those things out so they're not sort of all talking at the same time. Um, another nice thing is here is we can look at, the, what we began to kind of look at is looking at the variation between these, these sites. And so this is beginning to figure out how, we, how we're measuring these sites. So we're looking at the, ma the maximum time from midnight, which is at zero, to essentially 6 a.m., and we can take the value of that and estimate how big that chorus is or how much acoustic activity is happening at those reefs. And so that's basically what you see here. So we're looking at that strength of that corpuscular, that daily trend. And we're looking at tektite, TEK, Yawzi, and Ramhead, and comparing that to fish density. So the graph on your left is basically looking at our dust to, dust to uh, midnight magnitudes uh, and dawn to midnight magnitudes for our three sites. Um, and the fish frequency and the graph on the right is actually our shrimp frequency. And what you can see is there's a positive relationship here between fish density and uh, the strength of that trend. So again, um, more activity basically at tektite versus ramhead and yawzi. So this is giving us an indication that we can use this probably to this corpuscular course, this daily course, it's actually going to be used or estimating uh, fish density, whereas we can't really use the snapping shrimp sounds. Um, we can also compare us to the coral cover, and we kind of find the same trends. Nice positive relationship, so increasing relationship. We're going to go from ram's head to yawzi to tektite, from our low, low sites to our more diverse sites in terms of coral cover and that acoustic activity. So there's a positive kind of relationship here between our fish sounds on the left uh, and the present coral cover. But we kind of see a flat relationship with our shrimp. So the snapping shrimp don't really seem to be a very good predictor of that habitat quality, the reef or the coral, because we're kind of finding them everywhere. But, but the, the fish sounds, because there's a diversity of fish there, seem to be related to both the coral cover and fish or, in fact, that whole coral reef community. Another way to look at this is kind of a heat map, similar to what you saw before. So on the left is, again, the sound level, the sound power. Um, then you see frequency kind of below, and the time of day on the right. And those peaks here are tektite. So this is the dawn and the dust peak. So hotter sounds are, again, kind of meaning um, uh, louder sounds. And you can see lots of loud sounds here uh, at dawn, and lots of loud sounds at dusk. Um, and especially in these low-frequency fish bands. So a lot basically happening in this low frequency for fish at tektite. But I've kind of put those together, and we don't see these nice putt peaks at, Yaw at Yawzi in the middle graph here, or Ramhead in the, in the bottom graph. And there's a nice red peak here in Ramhead, and that is something that got stuck on the hydrophone and started banging against our hydrophone. <laughs> One of the kind of things we need to figure out is how long we need to take these measurements. Right? So can we go out there and just throw a hydrophone in the water for one day and get an assessment? Or do we really have to go out there for a long period of time and kind of begin to, does that help us basically understand the reefs? And so one way to think about that is, does basically the time of day or the time of month matter for when we make those measurements? And we saw, because there's dawn and dusk courses, time of day matters. And we also see that um, time of month matters. So these fish are seem to be responding to our, our lunar activity. So on the y-axis here is the, the sound level. On the x-axis is the frequency in hertz. Um, and so this is basically looking at the strength of, of acoustic activity at different frequencies. And you can see that tektite, our nice, rich, blue site here, peaks in these low-frequency fish bands when there's basically a new moon, whereas the, when, there's no full, when there's a full moon, when there's a lot of light, not making those sounds. So it seems like they're responding with a, when, the, when they're, they kind of were wanting to use those spawning sounds when there's kind of hidden or when there's basically not a lot of moonlight activity. Um, again, that, that's important for when we're making those measurements, just practically speaking, and it, and it gives us a little reflection of basically what the activity is happening out there. So these new moon periods seem to be important for the, both these animals as well as when we uh, make our measurements. And kind of making stuff in the, in the darkness in the new moon is, again, uh, it's very reflective of some other understandings of, of uh, reef activity where it's a good time for animals to basically hide from visual predators. So if you can do your, do your reproduction at night, hopefully your eggs won't get eaten by the predators or you get eaten by the predators. And then, as I mentioned, time of day matters. So this is kind of the same graphs, um, but, but basically comparing midnight to dawn to noon. And you can kind of again see, if you look at this dawn, these nice peaks in tektite um, and blue. Uh, 
Oh, you don't see those peaks at, at midnight or at noon. So again, the sound levels are highest at tech night in these fish frequencies at dawn. Again, this is nice dawn chorus, just like you hear a bird chorus um, when early morning. And uh, the fish are kind of responding. It gives them a nice sort of time of synchrony, probably, to make those sounds. But we don't necessarily see that there's a, at other sites. We don't necessarily see that at, um, at other times of day. Uh, because we like snapping shrimp in my lab, we also were kind of comparing this to the local conditions. And snapping shrimp, just like many invertebrates, are called ectothermic animals, meaning they basically are kind of sensing or, or the same sort of temperature or conditions of the, of the water around them. And so we really wanted to compare if the if with daily water temperature on the left or the light levels change, what happens to snapping shrimp as well. So on the y-axis here is the snap rate, the daily snap rate at tektite, and, um, and the, uh, the change in water temperature as well as the change in light levels. And you can see that tektite basically increases in temperature, uh, the snap rate increases with water temperature and uh, decreases as, as light in basically increases as well. Uh, so there's a positive relationship with water temperature and a negative relationship with light. But these snapping shrimp are responding to these conditions as well. And we also see this kind of a similar activity with basically lunar phase as well. So they're decreasing their snap rates, both the tech rate and the Aussie with, uh, with uh, light. And then so finally, so the last way that we're kind of looking at these tri dial trends is basically looking at, we now figured out a new way to kind of look at this, but we're sort of integrating the area underneath these dawn and dusk areas. So we're trying to look at the whole area underneath these curves. Um, we found this more kind of a robust way to look at these sites. And as I mentioned, kind of, I wanted to kind of get back at all our sites. That's what you see here, all these blue dots, and comparing it to both species richness and species and genus richness, so the, the richness or the diversity of those sites, and looking at the area under those curves, and we see a positive relationship. So the more rich, the more diverse the site, the more area basically under that curve or the more sound that's being produced at dawn and dusk. So these really, these daily trends seem to be related to the diversity that we're finding on this reef. So that's great. It's very reflective of kind of what we're, seems to reinforce to basically what we're doing here. Um, so basically, uh, in, just to kind of sum up in terms of our ecological conclusions here that we are looking at long-term assessments and these are kind of vital when we're making our assessments in time of day matters. But it's also, we see that these crepuscular magnitudes, these dawn and dust uh, trends uh, also matter as well. So I briefly kind of want to touch on number two here, which is listening how we can track human patterns on the reef. Um, and that's just basically uh, because this is pro potentially useful to the national park. And um, while we know that noise is increasing in the ocean and this can impact animals, we also know that uh, um, the Virgin Islands National Park has over 200 plus boat moorings. And it may or may not surprise you, but our National Park Service is underfunded. <laughs> and um, the, the managers there don't have a good way of figuring out who's using what moorings when. It's sort of like a honor system sign out thing that you drop in a box and someone maybe eventually goes out and checks it. <laughs> um, but so they don't really have a good way of tracking when boats basically pull up and use their moorings. Um, but as you may or may not know, boats are noisy. So this is just one of our boats, uh, one of the boats on a reef. It's fairly loud, and we can kind of really detect that, that from a long ways away, but we can also detect how often boats are basically passing particular reefs, and which reefs are they passing. So are they using the really nice reefs, like Tektite, better or more than, than other reefs. Um, so we're kind of, com again, comparing to our three sites, Tektite, Rot, Yazi, and Ramshead. And kind of uh, what I wanted to show you here is basically that these reefs, these boats are, are both utilizing these reefs as well as changing the soundscape, changing the sounds that are there. And so the graph on the left here is basically reef with boat noise. Uh, the graphs on the right are reef soundscapes only, so no boat noise. And visually, you can see those spectrograms are quite different. And so if these animals are using sounds in this marine environment, that sound is potentially masking or hiding biologically relevant sounds there. Another way to do this is a little more quantitatively, is look at the maximum frequency, or what's called the peak frequency. And we can see that when boats are present, the peak frequency basically shifts, uh, shifts lower. So there's much more lower frequency uh, sound there. Again, lower frequency from the boat noise. At, um, is that all our reefs? 
And we also see that the sound levels are higher. So they're putting more sound energy, basically, into the environment when the boat is present versus absent. So they're really changing these patterns, and these, change, these patterns are track, uh, trackable. And finally, when are they basically utilizing our reefs? So um, this is, again, Tektite, Yazdi, and Ramhead. And this is just a, a subset of our data here. This is just four months during the summer period. So this is actually the off-season in the Virgin Islands here. Um, and, uh, but boats are basically detected at all reefs throughout the deployment period. So basically, almost every day we're finding uh, uh, boats ac across our reefs. So there's a fair amount of boat noise being introduced there. But Tektite had the highest number of detections. So you can see the blue dots are a little bit higher there. Um, but it was spread evenly across the week. So it's a little bit different than a lot of other places where you don't really have the weekend warriors that go out there. Um, basically, people are utilizing uh, the, the environment all the time. But what's pretty cool here is we can begin to kind of look at the daily trend of human activity on these reefs. And so that's what you see here. This, this bottom graph is time of day. And the y-axis is proportion of hours, basically, with boat noise at our three different sites, Tektite, Yawzi, and Ramhead. And um, you see, particularly at Tektite, there's more increased activity during the day, during these light middle hours here. Um, we also see that, uh, that there's a lot of increased activity, particularly tektite, at 8 a.m. and 8 and 10 p.m. So that's kind of cool. That means that uh, we're basically picking up these boat activity or when the animal people are probably pulling up to the moorings early on in the morning. And potentially, we're getting when they're utilizing the mooring, mooring later on in the evening, so at 8 or 10 p.m. What's other cool is that you don't necessarily need to make boat noise, essentially, at 8 or 10 p.m. You don't need to use your engine. We could also be picking up generator noise. Why that's kind of cool is because we might be picking up sailboats, right? So sailboats don't necessarily use their, their engine. Um, but if we can pick up the generator noise when they're at the mooring, that gives us a way to track these, these quieter boats. Um, so it gives us a way to kind of track more activity, basically, at these, at these reefs. So we're not only getting by, you know, fish activity on these reefs, but we're getting kind of human activity as well. Okay, so our last like two or three slides here. Um, basically, in summary, we're kind of finding these nice tr ecological trends, these short and long-term daily and lunar trends that we're finding out there that are observable. And, and, and what we're also finding is how and when we make our measurements are, are crucial. So some of the early sort of sound in the sea measurements, while we sort of reinforced this was kind of like a two-minute measurement, but as we kind of go out there and we look at uh, that there's a lot of variability out there in these reefs, and when we take our measurements is, is actually pretty important. Um, and again, we're kind of looking at, um, for management purposes, we can do remote monitoring of the human biological sounds, and, and that's really feasible out there. So we can kind of listen for both the human usage as well as the animal usage of these reefs. And finally, sort of our last, last slide here, different ways that we're kind of going this. And I've mentioned there's a huge project here, and we're kind of doing a bunch of different things. We started to put ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, basically on the reefs to kind of survey the reefs for us. So that's this little blue creature here, this robot that you basically see on the reef. Um, I haven't, di haven't talked about it today, but we're starting to look at, now that we kind of know how to make the reefs and we're beginning to understand the variability on those reefs, we can kind of look at changes on those reefs. So what's the influence of the coral bleaching event in Maui, but what's the impact of Irma and Maria on the reefs? We're m measuring how our larvae are basically finding their way to the reef. And of course, these little creatures, back to our, our snapping shrimp here, and what drives them from being this sort of cacophony or bedlam of noise on the reef. And that's it. So there's a huge amount of people involved in these projects here. I kind of gave you a couple pictures of them along the way, but uh, this is it. Thanks very much.